for a horse to win an Ida Chase, a Scottish National and a, a Coral Scottish National and a Bet365. It's unbelievable and a very special horse. Go to hostel with Betsy, you know, certain days and I can be confident in my staff that, that the job's still getting done. Morning Christian, thanks so much for having us this morning. Um, we've had to look around your stunning yard. It's a really unique setting um, and I'm eager to get into your burgeoning training career. Already so much success. But before we do, I want to go back to the start of, of your story and racing's in your blood really and you're involved in it from a long, a long stage. You said that you could ride before you could walk. Just tell us a bit about your first encounters with, with horses. Yeah, brought up with ponies all our life. Um, my father's always at a riding school, traded in horses. So yeah, basically didn't have much, much option. But then it's, I'm one of six and myself and Nicky ride very well. My two other brothers, one's a kitchen fitter, one's a plumber. They probably haven't ridden for 30 odd years, but they could probably jump on a horse tomorrow and ride it to a good standard. Yeah. And then two never got involved. But yeah, myself and Nicky out of the children were, were the keen ones. Yeah, and obviously now we know you as the trainer, but grade one winning jockey and rode some excellent horses as well. I'm really keen to talk about those days, especially when you were based at, at Paul Nichols's around horses like Big Bucks, Denman, Neptune, Collange. I mean, how do you look back on that time now? What was that like getting to ride some of those horses? Yeah, they're wonderful times and obviously learned, learned the right way. So, um, my training career now being a pause, pause Get a few so bollockings. Yeah, plenty of bollockings, <laughs> but you know, you. You can take them and when you get a bollock in, you try and put things right. But no, it's one wonderful times, good horses, French, good French horses, good Irish horses. Paul Paul had a good market there in France at the time, so they were, they were special years. Yeah, and obviously a lot of people know that you are you had a good relationship with Denman. You were saying earlier, unbeaten on him? Yeah, three from three. From three. <laughs> I was meant to ride him in the Chalo one year, and I think it was called off about 20 minutes before the first race, which is a shame. And then they rescheduled then and Ruby was available. And that was when he won at Cheltenham. And how did it feel sitting on him for the first time? What did, what did it feel like? I mean, he was called the tank. He must have given you a pretty special feel. Yeah, he wouldn't show a whole lot at home, but he was um, came with a big reputation and he was very raw the first time he ran, but he was a completely different horse. And a few weeks later, then he won very impressively second time out and looked, looked like a special horse. And what about Big Bucks? There's a story you rode him with a broken ankle. Tell us about that. Yeah, he, I rode a horse in the race before and he ducked through the wing with me. So basically broke my leg. So I managed to sneak past the doctor at the time and took uh, to keep painkillers in the bag then and jumped on him to ride in the next race. I think it was a kingmaker, novice chase, but couldn't bend my leg and put it in the iron. So. I had to get carried back off him then. It's a shame never got to rode him because he was he was obviously a good horse as well. Yeah. But that was an obvious chase and he ended up being one of the one of the best staying hurdlers then. Yeah, what sort of thrill did it give you to be on horses like that on, on big days as well? Yeah, good, very lucky. Twist Magic, Neptune, Roy Leclerc, Denman, Tyrannis. Yeah, good 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 feel out of them and you know, they obviously trained trained very well as well, schooled well. And what sort of insight does that give you as a trainer now, looking back on those times and having those good horses? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we try and, we try and um, you know, trying to put longevity into our horses. So we basically trying to win with them as five and six year olds, but we have a bit of a plan then. It'd be great to still be winning or running in big races at 10 and 11. So, you know, we train them there. Same with Paul's, not, not you get into a certain fitness level as fit as you can without without being too hard on them, on, them, on them at home. Yeah, and around good horses, also around good people. You touched upon Paul. From working in close quarters with him, what do you think it is that makes him such an outstanding trainer? A uh, bit of, obviously got a you know, simplicity, good setup there and obviously a winner and, and, and so driven. So it was competitive sport and you just got a good way of get some horses to a certain fitness level and you know, his horses and they seem to run run well all the way throughout the season rather than just peaking them at the start of the year and then tapering off then. You're always trying to keep keep the horse in momentum all the way through. 
Yeah, we see that with how his horses run throughout the season. And, and what about when Ruby was there? Because obviously he had that relationship with Willie Mullins, but he was riding Corto, Denman, etc., um, all the time. I mean, what was that like for you as a jockey coming up and, and being around someone like him who was, you know, top dog? Yeah, Ruby's obviously a great rider. And I think in the beginning, it was just before Willie started getting the real good horses. And then obviously later on then it become clashes but they seem to have a good relationship that um you know ruby spent x amount of days in ireland and then paul would probably enter his, his better horses around outside of those days and just got, got the clashes and the cheltenham which which they sorted out between themselves and did you learn a lot from him watching him ride being around him or did he keep everything very close to himself yeah we wouldn't see him too much on the yard just turn up the races but you know, he's a good man, got a good relationship with him now. Whenever we have runners at Punchestown, we keep him at his father's place, Ted Walsh's. So he always congratulates me when we have a nice winner. So he's always been, always been uh, uh, very nice to me. Yeah, and how does those times working in a yard inform how you treat your staff? Because you've been there on the ground and, you know, worked your way up that way. Yeah, not so much. Even outside of that, I think you get brought up from from a young person to be to be respectful and and you obviously realise in our game you're so reliant on your staff. I'm not sure if it works out in all other aspects of business, but in our business you are reliant on on the quality of staff riding your horses every day. You you see a difference in you know certain horses if they're getting well ridden, they're a completely different horse to if they're getting badly ridden. So and feedback and everything and and taking pride in what you do on the yard, not just the riding of the horses, but, you know, maintenance and, and everything. Yeah, and you said earlier that your your staff are like your your family almost. Do you think that's a, a good mentality to have, you know, treat treat your staff as, as well as you'd like to be treated? Yeah, that would have been my, my motto all the way through. And we've got such a good team of staff. And, you know, they, they um, what they did for us last year for my family when, when Betsy was ill, you know, they basically run the yard there for a month and we still finished the season well. So, you know, just, but I was, I knew that that was, you know, you, you prep them for, from when they come with you for when you get, we never thought we'd end up in that situation. But if I was ever not on the yard, you'd hope that it would run, that it would run the same. Yeah, and we saw this morning Jack Tudor is still a, a key part of that now with a new job with David Pipe, obviously, but still a major member of your team. And you spotted his talents from very early on and you've always been very vocal about how much you thought of him as a rider. Still only 21, did you say earlier? Um, tell us a bit about him and, and how you sort of sourced his talent. Yeah, he's very special talent and we're obviously very proud of um, proud of Jack, obviously, but proud of the way we've handled him and, and exposed him in bigger races. And then when the pipe job came along, then it was great that, that he could take that and hopefully be able to manage, be able to manage the two, fingers crossed. And he's always been a special talent and, you know, even just not just a riding the horse around the yard and takes pride in what he does. So it's been, been great to, to see him over the years. It's been great to give him big winners and give him plenty of experience. Yeah, and is it is it that he's you know he's got good hands or a good seat or good over a fence? What what is it about him that you sort of latched onto straight away? Yeah, a bit of everything really. From schooling as a youngster, just had a good natural talent, and and he knows where the winning line is. He's you know be one of the last to if he'd be one of the last to go for his horses. He knows where the winning is. He ride a winner at Stratford the other day in a small race, but. I think he got past, he nearly made the running, got past turning in and didn't panic and got back up on the line then. So even at the smaller meetings and the big races, great over a fence, he's a, he's a good stride. Will you give him much advice or did you in the early stages or do you keep keep things pretty quiet with yeah, your jockeys? Maybe early on, we don't say too much. And obviously I had my brother Nicky, who was a good amateur for Jack to look up to when he was younger. So we like to feel that he's had a good, um, good ground in and he's obviously taken it to another level now. And one of your big stars early on was Potter's Corner winning the Welsh National. You said, I think that was Jack's first ride of offences or something incredible like that. Yeah, I think he'd ridden point to point winners, maybe hunter chase winners, but I think he'd ridden one winner over a fence. But uh, we thought we had a the horse there prepped um, and then we tried to get Jack on him before the race ends. So Jack won a hurdle race on him three weeks before for Jack to get a good, good feel for the horse. And he was obviously all geared towards the Welsh National and he won the Middles National the year before. 
So his big target was, was the Welsh Nationals, be, be special if we could have won that race. And obviously Jack claimed in seven and we, we knew he was more than capable to, to, to expose Jack at such a young age in, in such a big race. We've learned a lot this morning about your training philosophy and, and your approach and you've had so much success. It seems crazy now, but you said it, you weren't even sure it was what you wanted to do. You loved being a jockey, but you were sort of ushered into the training side of things. Yeah, just being lucky, really, and you obviously take what cards cards you dealt. And um, you now we're lucky to come back home and be able to train train horses from you. Yeah, started off at Die Walters, is but just Die Walters forced me into getting the license, really. So what did he say? Well, how does that work? Uh, it's probably just to help him out, really, at home. So he didn't have to send all his horses away, so he could save a few pound. <laughs> but now we're lucky, and just lucky to find some special horses then along the way. They said we'd never. After Potter's Corner, we struggled to find another horse like him and they just seemed to keep popping up. Yeah, and it is a, a very unique space that you train in. You've got a barn, you've got limited number of boxes, but you have so many facilities here, the beach, um, you know, schooling grounds, et cetera, et cetera. Were you always confident? Did you always back yourself that you thought, right, now I've got my own place and I'm starting out, I'm, I'm going to make a success of this? Yeah, I think when you're a certain age and you've been... You've been brought up um, in sport and you're competitive, then then you back yourself wherever you you just take what facilities you're given and and back yourself to be a success. Yeah, and then the words you said to us when we walked in the yard this morning were, "Welcome to the how working class people train." It's amazing that you made it made such a success out of it, but you're very much sort of proud of your roots, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, just got you know, like you just got the beach, but simplicity and seems seems to work. It, and it seems mad to me that you weren't you weren't convinced you wanted to train, but it's clear that you get a lot of pleasure out of it. You take you take a hands-on approach to a whole new level. I mean, you're helping tack up. But I don't think I've ever quite seen that in a trainer to the same level before. I mean, why is that? Is it saving money? Is it because you still love it? Uh, just to be try and be a leader, really, and hope that your staff will, like you said, when you're not there, your staff will be thinking, what would Christian do? And just try and lead from the front and set set good examples. Yeah, and talking of Potter's Corner, we'll get into a little bit more of this, but everything you do is so strategically planned, it seems. That Midlands National, Welsh National, those sort of races, how far out did you spot that there could be an opportunity to win them with him? Yeah, we always knew Potter's Corner was a good horse, and that was a particularly dry, dry winter. I think he'd have won the Ida Chase. He fell at the second last, third last in the Ida Chase. I think he would have won that. I haven't watched it back to this day, but um, he was going well that day and the ground was dry in Newcastle and it was only a matter of time before as soon as the ground comes off for him, for him to win a big race. And Midlands National was the plan then and they rained on the day and everything just, just worked out perfectly for him in the Midlands National. And winning nationals is, is now what you do. You know, Welsh Grand Nationals, Scottish Grand Nationals. Why, why do you think you excel so much in these, in these staying chases? Yeah, I'm not sure really whether... We just had luck that these horses have, have come along and um, or whether it's the way we train them and, and you know, don't put them under so much pressure throughout at a young age or just, I'm not sure really, but we seem to, ex you know, there's no, it's, it's written there, the, the type of races we won, you know, to have won two Scottish Nationals last two years, two Ida Chases last two years and obviously what Potter's Corner did before that, so we obviously it seems unique in the, the training system. Obviously, um, Masuto staying chasers. Yeah, and it is a tough place to be training now. You know, you're talking about rising costs of things and, and you know, struggle, a lot of people struggling for owners, struggling for staff. You said actually the opposite is true with staff, with yourself. You have people who come up to you and say they want to work for you. I mean, are you not finding it, you're not as finding it as difficult as other people perhaps in this current climate? No, we seem to do okay for staff. We, we read a lot of negative things all the time, but from my experience, we seem to, you know, we do well for staff. We're very lucky that we've got competent staff and good experienced staff. And in terms of the costs and, and difficulties and challenges that you face when, when you're training, I mean, you're sponsored by uh, NAF, so obviously that, that helps you in that respect. But what do you have to navigate sort of on a, on a regular basis with, with costs? Do you find it difficult or are you prevailing on top of things? Yeah, not too bad. We seem to win the big races, which make a difference then with the, 
with your percentage money and um and I think my feed, for example, last year at Christmas went up from twelve pound a bag, twenty five kilo bag to sixteen pound a bag. So it's big it's you know, it's tough tough for everyone out there, but um you know, if we can keep winning those big races, then we've got a chance. Yeah, and, and you will if that's your, you know, if you carry on with what you've started. You were saying earlier about a horse like Captain Nord. You, you're very conscious of the handicapping system, and that's something that you zone in on. You know, never won a race over, rated over 130, this horse. How do you go about planning his season, and how do you get him to peak on those big days? And, and you've done it with all your other horses as well, Kitty's Light, who we'll talk about in a minute. But just tell everyone how your approach is to training horses. When you haven't got that many, how many have you got in now? Uh, 33, 35. So to win those big races with horses that, you know, probably didn't at the start of your career, didn't cost that much money. How, how do you go about targeting them and, and pulling it off so many times? Kitty's like last year, he seems to come into himself in the spring. That seems to be his time of year. But you can't just not run him for 10 months of the year and then suddenly run him in March and April. You know, he's owned by a good set of owners. They like going racing. You know, he likes going to Kitty's Eye, actually. He, he likes going to Kempton, but the three mile races at Kempton are a little bit sharp for him. But he still runs well there, picks up good prize money for finishing third, finishing second in, you know, in the Coral Chase and those type of races. And then in the spring, then he, you know, he finds himself on good marks. And then the four mile chase is then on good ground which you don't get in in the winter, you know, Midlands National, Welsh Nationals, it just wouldn't wouldn't suit Kitty's Light. But then when he gets his good favoured ground, then he, he comes into his own. And then they get in the winning, get in the winning groove, then they, you know, like any human being in business, in sport, once they, once you manage to get their head in front, then they, they become a different animal then. And you are a big believer in confidence that once a horse wins once, OK, they might be at the right end of the handicap, but they're going to win again and bring that forward. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, Potter's Corner won the Welsh National. We won a hurdle race three weeks before. I tried to put him in the best possible position to, you know, to be confident and, and going into the Welsh National. Every every box was ticked. And then, um, you know, win my wings when we, she won the Scottish National last year. She'd won the Ida Chase before that. Kitty's light. Scottish National, last year we went to the, we thought we had a well handicapped horse to run on the Friday to put Jack in a confident position going into the Scottish National last year when he rode Kitty's Light to finish second. So yeah, we try and, you know, target things through confidence and... It seems to me that you you don't understand how other trainers do things a little bit this morning in the way that you, you campaign horses. You know, you're willing to, to sacrifice almost one end of their career, the start, for the end is that is that true do you sort of see things that way yeah a little bit you know the dream would be to the dream would be to have horses to to just to turn up at Chepstow on Friday and, and win a maiden hurdle by 30 lengths but it just doesn't you know it just doesn't work like that and you know when you're usually starting your three mile point to point is usually start them off over two mile you know you want to jump in to be sharp over two miles sometimes first time out you don't want to be stretching them to three mile and you know if they can turn into a two miler then they can you know they can have a two mile career to a certain level and then step them up in trip then but you're just getting to figure them out from the start it's hard to you know you need to be running horses training them to, to get to know them so you're basically the smart prescott of the jumps yeah i don't go that far and you know <laughs> wind my wings was um you know she wasn't ready to run over four miles till she was a nine-year-old we, we bought her at five and she just wasn't mentally, she was a bit on her toes. She traveled a bit too strong in her races. So until she got to that age and relaxed a little bit, she wasn't ready to, to be stepped into either chases and, and Scottish nationals. And a lot of what you do is around getting horses to relax. You've said that this morning. Just talk about why you think that mentality is so important when it translates to onto the track. Uh, just, just, we try and get them you know, in a good mental place, get them saving energy all the time. We get them not just about the race. You know, when they travel to the races, you want them relaxed. When they're in the paddock, in the, in the stable before the race, you, you want them relaxed. You know, you just try and get them in a good mental place. And, and then you'd hope then that in the races, they, they're doing their best work at the end. Yeah. And with a lot of your owners, you will sort of sit down at the start of the season and, and talk to them and make a plan. 
with almost every single one of your horses. How important is it that those owners buy into what you're trying to do and, and are a part of what you're trying to do and you're working with them rather than against them? Yeah, that's important. Yeah, most important things for the horse as well. And, you know, if the horse is owned by good owners and the horse is capable of winning races then, then he's got a good chance then of, you know, as you said, winning those, winning those bigger types of races. When it comes to sourcing horses, we were speaking before about the monopoly that people like Willie Mullins have on, on the market. How difficult do you find it to get your hands on one of these good horses from the position that you're in? Yeah, the, the hardest bit is obviously sourcing the horses. You get different relationships with, with different people in Ireland and people you get lucky with, you go back to them then. But, you know, Willie was, Willie was at it probably 15, 20 years before just didn't suddenly start training and you know Willie's Willie's gone through the rough times as well. Yeah, and you you know him quite well and you've been around successful people, but is it difficult when you feel like one person is taking their pick of all those best Irish point to point horses and, and you're sort of having to, to work hard to find a way through? Yeah, not too bad, but we you know, we have great fun out of winning Scottish nationals and, and Welsh nationals and so, you know, when we get our horses to, to do that and, you know, we don't bump into Willie and, and those type of people. But even if they turned up in those races, we'd be, you know, when you're, when you're in a handicap, you've got as good a chance as beating them in handicaps as, as they've got beating you. So. And you're going to take some of your runners over to Ireland in the next couple of weeks. Lord Snooty, I mean, how, how is that going, taking them on on their own turf? Yeah, no, how we look forward to We went to France with Potter's Corner a couple of times, win my wings beat one of uh, McKay's top, top mares at uh, Compiègne one day and we, we enjoyed that. Yeah, and there's a lot of discussion at the moment about the, the dominance in Ireland and the strength in Ireland. I mean, presumably you don't think they're better trainers, they're just getting their hands on the, on the better raw materials. How do you think the, the scenario sits at the minute between Britain and Ireland? Yeah, I don't take it. You know, I've got my own horses, my staff, my family to worry about. It's, you know, we look forward to going to Galway and taking them on. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure you'll, you'll make a success of that. Um, and Cheltenham, another thing that is a big buzzword and, and, you know, Cheltenham means everything. Getting winners at Cheltenham can really help drive momentum with your career. But again, it's something that you've sort of said, we can sacrifice that until we've got real live players. Yeah, it seems to have been at this stage of our career anyway. We seem to have done well outside of Cheltenham. Why, why do you think that is? Um, maybe not quite as competitive, but we've also chased good prize money, Midlands Nationals, the Scottish Nationals, etc. Ida chases, so you're probably sacrificing your, your, your Cheltenham runner to run in those, to peak them in those races as much as you can without going to Cheltenham. But this year, Kitty's like might, might run there this year because he'll obviously have the Grand National plan. So it seems to have worked with other trainers to run it. I think when I finished second in the National Royal Eclair, he'd run in the Gold Cup at Cheltenham. Obviously last year's Grand National winner won at the Cheltenham Festival. So it probably be a, could be a prep for Kitty's Light maybe to, to run at the festival next season. And let's talk about him a bit because he's an extraordinary horse. We saw him this morning. He really is tiny. There's nothing to him. Flatbread. What do you remember from him when he walked into the yard? Yeah, nothing really originally, but when we broke him in as a yearling, and then he, he had a great way of going. He had a, he had a, carried his head in a good place, had a good lolloping stride and couldn't, when he ran the bumper first time, he finished, I think he was sixth or seventh or 13. So could never say he was going to do what he did. But he, he always had a nice way of going. And by Nathaniel, you wouldn't have thought he'd necessarily been a hurdler, but, but staying chases in his game and he's so consistent as well. What do you think, you know, makes him such a good racehorse? Yeah, I think when you, when you sit down and think what he did last year, it's probably something that you can't say it'll never be done again. But for a horse to win an Ida chase, a Scottish national and a, and a, a Coral Scottish national, the bet 365 the following week is, you know, when you sit down and think it through. It, um, you know, it was very, for him to do that, you know, even the mileage, the traveling to, to air nine, nine hours in the lorry, nine hours back, and five days in the field, and then straight to Sandham, then six days later. It's unbelievable, and he's a very special horse. 
we don't know what he's was different to him, but I don't know if you did any tests on him when his career is over or something. There'd be something different inside somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Do you get nervous when you're watching him on those on those big days, especially when you know your horses? They tend to get really well backed, such as the confidence in in your abilities with this type of horse these days. Yeah, just the pressure you're under, really, for your business, your family, and and the staff and everything. But um, he seems to be a very good horse and not not letting you down. So you're not too bad when he's running. Good celebrations after, good party. Yeah, great. Yeah, you just need a bit of luck with him because he likes to be ridden a little bit cold. He's he's a bit small, not over big, so he doesn't really. We don't like him in the hustle and bustle too much, and we we drop him in a little bit and. Um, he seemed to ha handle his fences much better last year. I don't know if he's a little bit stronger, but and he was in the after Christmas last year, and he got he got in a real good mental state. He was in and he did a piece of work there before the Scottish National that he probably the first time he'd reproduced that from the following year. So we knew he was in good form. Just need a bit of luck on the day there. So what's his campaign going to look like this year? All morning you've been telling us how different horses, you know, you plot out their whole season so early on. Grand National, and that's your main target. He'll probably go for the Coral Gold Cup then at, at Newbury. Be, you know, prestigious race and great prize money. So it'd be a good target for him as well. Yeah, you seem very level-headed, but you're dealing with these very talented horses and you're getting incredible results out of them. Is is Christian Williams, the trainer, just very, very easygoing, very level-headed? No, you need to, um, you know, you're under a lot of pressure all the time and, and you're competitive, so, but you've got to be careful, you've got to be, you need to be calm and you need to be careful. You know, when your competitors are watching, you need to, you need an edge and... What's your edge, do you think? Uh, we're just competitive. We try and stay level and, you know, try and give our staff confidence, jockey confidence and, and you know, hope we got the, ho the horse in the, in the right place when he goes to the races. And, you know, the race in Newbury is a very hard race to win, but you just never know what kit is like. The way the system is set up in this country, usually when you win your, your handicap or two, that's, that's you done then, but... You know, Kitty's like could could be improving. He could be the improving type, so could go to Newbury with a chance. I sense as well that you you see the bigger picture with a lot of these things, and obviously we know with what your family's been through recently that that there are other other factors at play. But you're you're keen to keep training relatively small. Do you think? Yeah, I would have thought. I would have thought that that suits me. That seems to have worked up until now. You know, there's. Um, Got no real ambitions of being and setting unrealistic targets of without sounding too negative of telling everyone we're going to be champion trainer in X amount of years or you know if we can keep if we can keep finding um, finding the nice type of horses that we get you know then as you were were saying about Captain Odds rating you know if they were in other yards they probably wouldn't be classed as a as a good horse being a 130 rated horse but to us he's, the horse is very special and. To have won over 300 grand in prize money off that rating since we've had him. He's a, he's a 10 year old now. We've had him since he was four, and he's still, you know, he won the Ascot, that 100 grand handicap at Ascot last year. And he's obviously going into veteran veterans races this year. You know, great prize money, good series that's been put on. If we can find, keep finding those special horses, keep, I said earlier, when when Potter's Corner came along, they said we'd never find another one like him. Then Wind My Wings, Kitty's Light, Captain Nord. So if we can keep, keep doing that, then to class my training career as a success, I think. We can keep, keep trying to win nice type of races. Yeah, but you're, you're not, as you say, you're not super ambitious. You just want to make a decent living out of it and, and enjoy these successes. I, I get a sense that you, you take a lot of pride out of the things you, you have achieved. Yeah, definitely. No, of course. And as I said, you're trying to be realistic and, um, you know, not get get too carried away that side of it when you've got other things, you know, on your mind as well, um, home things. So just try and keep everything level. And um, like you said, keep trying, keep trying to be competitive in, in the big races. And as you said, when, when we're getting ready for them big races, we go there confident and try and Keep, keep doing that. 
Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about family now because you've been with your half for an awfully long time, you were saying earlier, and it's well documented, um, the struggles that your family have been, been through this year. I mean, does that put training into perspective for you? Uh, not so much really, because I've always been a little bit like that anyway, you know, we appreciate that, um, you know, how lucky we've been up until, up until that happened. And, you know, I'm just lucky that my business can, car can carry on, you know, nearly as normal without me being there all the time. I can still go in in the morning, go to hospital with Betsy, you know, certain days, and I can be confident in my staff that, that, the, that the job's still getting done. So they keep reminding me that Christian Williams trained Kitty's Light for the first half of last year, and then they trained him for the second half. <laughs> so I don't know which bit was the most important, whether it's the first half or the second <laughs> half. <laughs> it really is a, is a team effort, and we and we saw that this morning. Um, you've had such great support from from the industry as well. The Jump Jockeys Derby at, at Chepstow, the charity races, and um, all sorts of fundraisers as well. How has that been throughout such a difficult time for you? Yeah, wonderful. We've had great support from from the start. And um, we're just lucky to be in, involved in racing, you know, to, you know, we can give it a push for certain charities and not just purely through being involved in horse racing. So we're like my family lucky to be, to be involved in the sport. And as you say, like, I'm um, appreciating little things like you see what the drugs do to the children mentally, you know, they're still using drugs now, treating the cancer that they were 30, 40 years ago. There's been no, no change in that. And, you know, for your young child, young girl for a hair to, to all fall out and I think I went to Utoxta the other day got home at um, half eight in the night and Betsy come downstairs and give me a hug for the first time in about six months so she's in a good stage now she went back to school last week and her mental state just completely she'd yeah. been like a depressed child for six or seven months we appreciate little things like that and but we were lucky we were going through such a tough time last year for Kitty's like to win those big races for Betsy to be watching them, Charlotte, Tilly. So a big, big boost and we're lucky, just lucky to be involved in, in the sport. And how much does it help when you, you've got other stuff going on that, that you can have a, a day like that to sort of bring you up? Yeah, brilliant. You know, enough for, as you say, it's not all about yourself, but, but all the family and... You know, you remember certain winners, you've seen nothing, won a, won, won a market raise on one day, not a hundred. We were sat in the hospital bed watching it on the phone and, you know, little things. We were just, just lucky and you know, Charlotte had to put her job to one side. Hopefully she'll go back in January. She's a band seven physio. So hopefully that can get back to a bit of normality then after that. And then, yeah, you just need the luck then. You get, um, you know, we thought we were in for a bit of bad news last week. So you try not to get down too low when things are bad, you try not to celebrate too much when you have good news, just try and stay, stay in the middle somewhere and um, just, you know, just have faith and hope that the people looking after you uh, know what they're doing. Yeah, do you find being around horses really helps you and being outside and having that lifestyle? Is that something that helps sort of ground you in these times? Yeah, I would have thought so, yeah. We've been lucky to be involved in them, lucky to work outside and no, we're lucky to be involved in, in the sport. You get plenty of negative, negative things, but you know, we, we're just you know, privileged to be involved in racing and, and it just, just goes to show the position we, we've been in, that we're lucky and hopefully we can um, you know, keep pushing with the charities now through, through racing and you know, hope for a bit of luck. Yeah, and is that something that you very much want to do more of and, and keep being a part of, of what you do is raising a lot of money? You were saying earlier, I mean, you've given money as well to a lot of different charities. It's, it's clear that that's really important to you. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, not just my family, but, you know, the other children we see in the hospitals and, you know, it's all about them as well. It's, they'll, they'll be at Chepstow on Friday and, and it'd be great to see the, the young children there and their parents, you know, they've probably never come racing before and, you can take them for a day at the races, they can see the horses, meet the jockeys, so it'll be great. And how invested are the family in, in Christian Williams racing? And I mean, do they come down to the yard much? Do they spend much time there? Do they go to the races much? Yeah, they start doing a tuck shop on a Saturday, so Betsy, oh, right. <laughs> Betsy looks forward to that now. So that's been, that's been a big, she 
couldn't really leave the house too much when her bloods weren't quite right. But when her bloods are in a good place, she she comes to the farm and you know they're lucky to come and see the horses. And we live about three miles from the yard, but they look forward to coming down on a Saturday morning. Yeah, and going to the races and enjoying the big winners as well. Yeah, they watched them. Um, Obviously, last year from home, and air, air would have been a bit far away, but they'd have definitely been at Sandown for the last day if everything was okay at home. It was a shame they missed that. But um, no, they enjoy, enjoy coming racing. Well, thank you so much for having us this morning. Thanks for taking time to chat to us. All our best wishes are with you and your family, and here's to an excellent season ahead. Thank you. Thank you.